Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next uh, webinar in the Shapeway series. Today, we have BASF joining us talking about 3D printing in the automotive industry. I am Rhonda Gee, Director of Marketing Communications for Shapeways. And today, our presenters are Steve Wirt and Jeremy Voss, and I'm going to turn it over to them. But before I do, please look at your chat in the right-hand side. That is where you can enter questions, and we will take them throughout the presentation. If we do not get to your questions, we will follow up individually with you. And with that, I will turn it over to Steve and Jeremy. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, yeah, so Steve Wirt, Director of Customer Success here at Shapeway. So essentially anything to do with the customer experience, um, you're going to work with me or my team to make sure we can um, get you what you need. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Jeremy Voss here. Um, I'm with BASF uh, Forward AM, the 3D Printing Solutions Division of BASF. Uh, I have commercial responsibility in North America for our powder bed fusion products. So that's uh, that's any SLS or MJF um, uh, um, materials, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, concurrently, I have responsibilities for all of our materials in the uh, in the automotive space. So I work uh, work predominantly in uh, in automotive, and that's uh, I guess why I was invited uh, invited here today. So thanks for the invitation and looking forward to uh, looking forward to the chat. We are starting off with a poll. If you look to the right of your chat tab, you will see your poll. And right now we want to know what your expertise in 3D printing is. So if we will give everyone a minute or two to answer. So my guess is you're definitely gonna have more of the, the intermediate. Just being, you know, Shapeways, BASF webinar, you never know, but that, that would be my guess if we're, if we're pulling ahead of time. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I think that uh, I, and you know I think the automotive space is is ahead of many other industries. Automotive's been using 3D printing for a lot longer. Um, we'll talk about this too as we go through, right? But um, um, automotive's been using uh, 3D printing probably as long as uh, as any industry, and is still one of the major users. And uh, so I would expect that to, that to come out to come out that way. Interesting. 65-35 so far. Great. Yeah. Okay. I think that is a good number. Yeah. So for that, I will turn it over to Steve to talk a little about Shapeways. Okay. So I, I'm guessing a lot of you probably do know who Shapeways is or might have heard Shapeways. But just to kind of give you a, a broad stroke is Shapeways makes industrial grade added manufacturing accessible by digitizing the end-to-end -end manufacturing process and by providing a broad range of solutions to our customers utilizing 11 added manufacturing technologies and more than 90 materials and finishes with the ability to easily scale new innovation. What does that mean? Essentially what we do is we take different ideas and products and bring them to life uh, using 3D printing and all the rest of our technologies, um, even all the way through traditional manufacturing. Um, and we've been around for quite a while now, uh, almost 14 years. You can see 20 million 3D printed parts um 6,000 parts a day so you can kind of give an idea of the scale of our global operation um and one of the things i'm the most proud of is 99 percent on time delivery so not only are we able to scale this massive massive level um, but we're actually able to get to the customers on time for whatever project or whatever deadline that they're they're looking to make happen and with that let's uh turn it over to basf all right so BASF, uh, I won't talk a lot about the our parent company. It's uh, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, 65 billion euro uh, company last year. Uh, forecasts are looking a little bigger this year. Um, so that's uh, that's good. Uh, BASF, the brand is Forward AM, or uh, which is uh, the branded name for 3D printing solutions. Um, so it started out as, uh, or the, 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 the company was established in September of 2017, as you see here, and um, and really established as a, as a new business arm of BASF. Uh, headquarters are in uh, gorgeous Heidelberg, Germany, which is just outside of Ludwigshaven, which is uh, the global headquarters for, uh, for BASF. Our team you know, globally just topped 200 folks, and uh, all of us are, are dedicated in one form or another, whether that be commercial or technical, uh, dedicated to the additive manufacturing space. And um, we'll talk in a little bit about uh, the different ways that we, we BASF, uh, engage the market. Probably 
One of the most significant things that I'd like to, to talk about in this introduction is our application technology centers. So we have three of these ATCs, we're calling them, um, exclusively focused on, uh, on customer projects and customer applications that are bringing us into industrialization. Uh, so the first one that was realized was uh, the one in Heidelberg, and, uh, and that one's been open since uh, 20, uh, 2018. Uh, the next one that opened was in Shanghai, and that one's been open since uh, 2019. And the one in North uh, North America is in Detroit, so right in the heart of the auto industry. And um, that one will open in September of this year. Uh, so we've got so we've got those those technology centers, and each one has a, a nice complement of equipment and uh, engineers to uh, to prove out ideas as as we move forward. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that in the. Uh, in the next next slides. So for BASF, Forward AM, our focus industries and where we look first to develop applications uh, are in, um, and these are in no particular order, but consumer goods, medical and, uh, and dental space, uh, automotive and transportation, and uh, and then of course aerospace. And just to talk a little bit more about uh, about each one of these on the on the consumer goods side, uh, the opportunities that we're looking for there are in uh, more in the production and uh, and in mass customization. Those uh, those types of uh, those types of applications. We've got some exciting ones that'll be that'll be we'll be able to publicize soon. Um, Medical and dental, of course, is more in the in the in the back end process side of things. Uh, automotive and transportation is what we're going to focus on today, so I won't belabor that point here. Uh, and then, of course, aerospace. Uh, we're seeing good success in uh, in aerospace as far as tooling goes. Um, we our 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 material uh, portfolio doesn't complement the flight worthy, but uh, but tooling and uh, and some of those uh, service parts and things like that we've had some good success with. Uh, other areas we're willing to explore: uh, industrial, cosmetics, construction products, um, robotics, which gets into tooling some, and we'll talk about tooling um, as we go through uh, today as well. And then of course uh, drones. So those are those. It's kind of a broad picture, a broad overview of uh, of what we are uh, of what we're after in uh, um, as far as industry applications go. Um, so let's dive into the, uh, the automotive side. Oh, no, we're going to dive into the automotive right after we dive into <laughs> the materials. <laughs> go ahead and go ahead and, uh, and, and bop over to the, the materials slide, Rhonda. Thank you. Um, so our, our technologies and materials, we focus on these areas. So we have um, for powder bed fusion, we have of course selective laser centering systems, SLS commonly known, and then also the multi-jet fusion process or high speed centering. Uh, MJF is of course the, the HP brand, but there are other, uh, there are other uh, manufacturers out there. Um, for the high speed centering or, or MJF process, you see the polypropylene and the TPU are, are ones right on top there. And that's where we focus for the MJF. For selective laser centering, we have all of these, these uh, materials available for the SLS platforms. So the polypropylene and the TPU, the PA6 family, which includes a mineral fill, the flame retardant, um, and uh, and also the uh, the the PA6 neat is a is a true PA6 material and uh, very very strong and very very heat resistance resistant uh, PA11 family of course and uh, and also our uh, TPU which is available for both the MJF and uh, and the SLS uh, on the filament side we do have the uh, the, the ultrafuse the standard filaments so what you would see in uh, uh, you know from from any any other offering PLA ABS. Um, but then we also do have a broad range of uh, engineering grade and high temperature filaments. And then, of course, what uh, what we're seeing the most traction in right now um, is our metal filaments. So we have a 316L and a 17.4 um, for fused filament fabrication or FDM, uh, the FDM process. Very, very interesting for for a lot of applications. Uh, our photopolymers are uh, are in the. Uh, are in the probably the ones that are that are growing the fastest right now uh, as far as technological advancements go. Uh, so we have uh, we have the uh, the ultra cure, the 3D, which is the rigid, and we've also got the tough, and then we've got uh, flexibles and elastomers coming through. Um, so there's a there's a fourth technology that uh, that we are that, that's it's growing right now, and that's uh, that's called services. So in that is coming uh, post processing. Uh, solutions, so that'll be that'll be down the road, uh, and then there's also a, a design uh, service, and so we we won't delve too much into that too deeply into that today, but uh, but we do have an ultra sim design service which can help 
um, with complex additive design processes. And uh, so that's something that, uh, that if you've got a complex uh, process, especially in lattice structures or, um, or in, uh, in special load cases, uh, it's something that we can, we can really help out with. So that kind of gives you a broad overview of the technologies and materials from BASF. Go ahead, Rhonda. Yeah. Amy, we have a question of the difference between the TPU on the SLS and the MJF. Yeah, so the base formulation is uh, is the same or very very similar. Um, there are some slight differences because of the difference in the in processing, right? There's a there's a difference in how an SLS machine processes material versus uh, versus an MJF. Uh, performance is uh, perform part performance is very very close. Uh, there are a couple of factors that are different. Um, the uh, uh, depending on how you choose to measure the shore hardness, um, the SLS can be a little bit harder. Um, but uh, but again, with you know with three D printing, you can you can change that dramatically with uh, with just how you you handle the uh, you handle the geometry. So on balance, performance is uh, is very very similar between the two. And if I'm correct. For all these different um, materials, these are all agnostic, right? These can work on all the different machines out there for all the different uh, OEMs and printers. Yeah, so so for the most part, that's true. Uh, the MJF process is a little more closed than uh, than some, uh, but it still it still is quite open. Um, for the uh, for the 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 FFF. Um, Filaments, that's exactly true. Any uh, any open any open system will uh, will run them. They come in standard sizes, and uh, the same with uh, same with photopolymers. Cool. Yeah. So this is what we were ta started talking about uh, started talking about earlier. This is from uh, the Wohler's report. Uh, and you can see here that uh, that the the top users of additive manufacturing automotive obviously is uh, is on top of that list. Um, and if you uh, if you drill down on the right, I think you can uh, you can see a little bit more about why that is. Um, still, the uh, vast majority of what's being used out there is uh, is prototypes and prototyping, and obviously still a, a viable option. And we're, and we're actually making great strides in um, in bringing those prototypes even closer to where they need to be. Um, Production is uh, is in the 49%, and then R&D, which of course supports uh, supports everything above it, is um, is 42. So you, you kind of get an idea there of um, of how how automotive and, and how automotive uses fit into um, into the big picture. And uh, and actually, as we go through today, we'll have some really good examples of uh, of prototyping and some production, and uh, and then also the spare parts. And that's really uh, that's really an interesting uh, an interesting thing. To, to talk about in 3D printing, right, is to is to start thinking about this idea of a digital inventory, uh, and so I think that's uh, that's where we that's where we land today is uh, is with this idea of uh, of beginning down the road of uh, of having files uh, instead of uh, in, uh, on hand instead of spare parts and being able to to print on demand. And I know that's something that Shapeways does now with uh, with some of their customers, um, uh, in in uh, in um, with, in some other industries. So it's a, it's an exciting uh, uh, it's an exciting application. This is How a trick. This is a trick question. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it is a trick question. But we're going to see what everyone's answer is. So we will give everyone a moment to answer this question. So please go to your polls tab, and let's see. Well, I think the last slide kind of helps you out a little yeah. bit because it kind of gives you the, just the scale, right, of all yep. the different things. Yep. You know, let's. So, don't want to give too much away there, but I do <laughs> think you got a little bit of a cheat sheet. I think. If you I think. Back at the, at the I one. think you're influencing some answers here as I'm watching the. <laughs> as I'm watching them come through live. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. Well, with that. I will go to the next slide and you can talk about all of the applications. Yeah, so this is one of the this is one of my favorite uh, slides to show um, both internally at BASF and externally um, with customers. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm sitting down with uh, especially folks that are deep in the automotive world, uh, none of this is a surprise, um, but but 
elsewhere, I do find uh, you know a real uh, high level of interest with uh, with this. So so this slide actually comes from BASF corporate, and uh, these are all of the ways that BASF corporate interacts with. Um, with the, the automotive industry. So if you if you look around there, you'll see that we've got these little blue squares, um, rectangles around different materials. So if you take those squares out, this is a slide that BASF corporate uses. Uh, so we added our uh, we added our little squares there to highlight the materials that we have available um, that are currently in use in um, in the automotive space and in, in, in automotive production, right? Um, so this gives you an idea of uh, PC, ABS, PMMA, um, polypropylene, of course, is a huge part of uh, uh, of manufacturing. But as you go around, you can see that we've got all kinds of opportunity for um, for uh, you know for functional prototyping, for um, for replacement parts, uh, for even for uh, you know some tooling applications where uh, where we can utilize similar material or uh, compatible materials to uh, to to aid in uh, in assembly. So, yeah, this is this is one of those slides that uh, that really can can tend to get people uh, get people thinking and uh, and asking questions about oh how how do I use additive now and how could I be using um, using additive in the future? So I don't know if it kicked up any any questions. Uh, Rhonda, but that was uh, that's kind of a it is kind of an interesting slide, and we can bounce back too if there uh, if there are other questions. We touched on this, um, uh, you know, the the uh, the strategies that we use um, for open and um, and moderate and closed systems. So, um, you know, BASF strives to work with uh, the open print systems, um, and so that is any any printer manufacturer that uh, that keeps their their parameters and uh, and their settings open, so that you can utilize whatever material that you want. The um, you know, there's there's positives and negatives, right? There's uh, you you may have more failures as you're learning, um, but you also have a, a broad range of materials available with an open print system. Uh, our cooperation uh, with hardware manufacturers, we've chosen some. You know, we we talked about HP already. Uh, we're we're working together to um, to create you know the best possible um, print uh, outcomes and. Um, in that instance, you will see a uh, you'll see a, a, a an addition to the the label that says uh, enabled by or powered by Forward AM, uh, and that indicates that we've worked with that manufacturer to make sure that the um, make sure that the the materials and the and machine combination are uh, are the best that they can be, and then closed systems we don't uh, we don't participate with uh, right now with with any of the manufacturers that have uh, that have closed systems. Um, that's uh, just a choice that uh, BASF has made strategically, and uh, and that's that's where we're at. So, um, Steve, I know you'd brought this uh, you'd brought this up uh, this up earlier. Um, anything there? Any other yeah. questions or, or 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 clarity needed there? Well, first of all, I love the idea of, of just making it open, right? And really not having it closed off to anybody. That really just makes you sure that you're not closing off innovation and you're just really kind of enabling everybody to, to use all the different um, materials. But can you give an example of one that's enabled by Ford AM that, you, that you're seeing out in the market that you specifically went together with a, a, you know, a company to kind of produce the best material? Yeah, absolutely. So, so that uh, the the prime example um, that's commercialized right now and, and out there is the TPU01, and that's the TPU for the HP system. Um, so that was a that was about a four and a half year process of uh, of sampling and testing with HP. Um, and so we we actually have a, a, a complementary system in our in our application technology center in Heidelberg, and HP of course has uh, has multiple teams around the world, um, and and we worked together with uh, with our uh, our application technology center and uh, and HP to uh, to make sure that that material was uh, was was formulated and uh, and ready to go for um, for the HP 5200 series. Wow, and you said four and a half years. Yeah, it was about four and a half years, correct? So okay. That, wow. That was in the works before uh, before um, you know uh, BASF 3D Print Solutions was uh, was officially um, officially started. Okay. And by the way, TPU cool. for everybody out there is one of the flexible materials that right. allows you uh, right. ability to kind of get a little flex when building. Yeah, thanks. I uh, that's a that's a good idea. It's it's a TPU is thermoplastic urethane, of course, and it's a, it's it's one of one of those uh, one of those elastomers. Um, really works. 
Thank you. We have another poll question. So we will give everyone a few moments to fill in where you think 3D printing is currently being used in the automotive industry. Well, I know, uh, I think back to like when I got my first car in like high school and I think of like all the little interior personalization things you can do. Um, this will be dating me, but you know, I was driving a manual. So you could even think of like your actual uh, drive shaft stick, you know, uh, changing gears. Um, that's a fun personalization, a little skull on top of it or, or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I just think yeah. you want to skew the results of every <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, fine. I mean, you could talk. We could talk about form fitting, you know, from a, from a prototype perspective. So, um, in prototypes is our most popular answer. Yep. So, with that, yep. let's move into what the applications actually are. Yeah, and so and so the um, you know this this slide this information is really gonna is really going to really reflect what we just uh, what we what we just saw in the poll question, right? So so. With this, I always like to talk about technological readiness level, the, the TRL, um, because it really gives us a, a, a good indication of what we can do, what's ready today, what's coming soon, and what's what's way off in the future, right? Ford, uh, Ford used to always talk about uh, now, near, and far. Now, this is this is kind of that same idea: what's now, what's near, what's far. Um, we don't have any far on here. It's all it's all now and near, so that's good. In uh, in the prototype section, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about each of these in a little bit. But uh, but we really do have a high TRL for design prototypes. Of course, those uh, that's been that's been in play for years. Uh, functional prototypes, and that picture that you see there is an interesting story when it comes to functional prototypes. It's probably not what you think, um, but it's really really interesting. And then um, we're just now with uh, especially with polypropylene moving into this idea of working on uh, pre-series um, or uh, as as we would call them uh, in North America test mules um, you know we do a new a new design model you've got to do uh, you've got to do tens or hundreds of test mules and um, really really good options there uh, jigs and fixtures we'll, we'll skip to the other side jigs and fixtures again um, ready to go and being used every day uh, this is probably the least um, exciting app uh, uh, application for 3D printing. It's not, uh, it's not, you know, it uh, doesn't, it doesn't hit the Wall Street Journal. It doesn't, uh, but it's also the thing that just keeps chugging and keeps working and keeps going and going and going. And it's making a huge difference in, um, in, in the assembly side of automotive, right? If you look at, um, at like, uh, like transportation aids, that, that gripper that's in the picture there, we, we won't talk about it because it's more industrial, but that's, that's utilized to move heavy objects around a factory, right? But it's made out of TPU, so you don't scratch anything. Um, the robotic gripper is the same way. It's, it can be much, much smaller, um, and used, uh, used as end of arm. Um, and then, of course, assembly fixtures, and we'll talk about that as we're as we're putting things together. Um, where our technological readiness level is in the in the in the uh, the near is in 3D printed foams, special series. Um, you know, you'll you'll see in the next year or two a uh, 3D printed portion of a seat, uh, and and some other applications like that. Um, Spare parts, of course, we'll we'll touch on that today. We have we have some work to do with materials to to get to the point where they're really really functional, um, and then the the individualization, and that's something that uh, that I think the technology is here, and uh, and we've got a couple of projects that are that are getting really close, and we'll be able to uh, you know do a lot of personalization um, in in uh, both interior and uh, and exterior. So. Um, yeah, this kind of gives you the, the big picture, right? The broad overview of, of where we've got more, uh, more readiness and, and what we have, uh, what we have to talk about today. So let's dive in Rhonda. All right. So start, wanted to start off with this one because it really is, uh, it really is kind of that classic, um, classic use for, for 3d printing. This is, uh, this is where stereolithography, uh, you know, of course, in the last 20 years really, uh, really has been used, um, most effectively, uh, in, in automotive is with appearance prototypes, right? Because you can, you can make large parts, you can make them relatively quickly, you can make them of high quality. Um, and the challenge now is to keep getting the finish quality, the accuracy, uh, keep getting those things better and better and better so that uh, so we can keep driving the price of, uh, of those down. Um, 
so one of the companies we're working with is Photocentric, and uh, their Magna machine, which is coming, is is large size, right? And uh, and so the the challenge is to have a big part that is of high quality that can be utilized, and you can kind of see in that. Uh, uh, maybe hopefully you've got it. You maybe have a bigger monitor than I do, but uh, but that panel that's called out there is uh, is part of uh, part of the rocker panel on a uh, on an example vehicle, and. Um, you know, coming with a, coming coming to the finish process with a part that doesn't need to be sanded, doesn't need to be um, doesn't need to you know have any special treatment other than just being coated like the rest of the body panels, um, really leaves us with uh, with a, 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 a huge efficiency gain in this appearance prototype market. So that's a uh, that kind of touches uh, on the uh, on the appearance prototypes um, application here. When you say like a large format prototype, is this a is this a big part? Like how big is this this prototype panel? Because what I'm looking at almost looks like a tank. Um, you know. Yeah. Over so here. it's a, it's a uh, what the the bigger picture it's a it's a camper van. So it's a it's a ah. it's a it's a, it's um it's on a Sprinter like a, a, a you know Daimler Sprinter chassis. Um, so that that part is uh, is probably um at its at its largest extent is probably um you know. 18 inches by 20 inches. Okay. So pretty good size. Talk about the coating. Yeah. So so in this application, um, the coating is going to be just a standard uh, standard automotive. Uh, surface prep would is cleaning, um, just just as you would before before you'd uh, you know you you'd paint uh, paint any vehicle, but the uh, but the coating is uh, just standard automotive. Same process, same process they would use to do uh, to do the rest. So, uh, so this is a little bit different, a um, little bit different take on a on a functional prototype, right? So, so rather than rather than an appearance model, rather than talking about uh, appearance, we're actually uh, actually the functionality here is in helping to to move the uh, move um, from from a, a, a metal or an alloy uh, into a polymer for um, for production, and uh, and so in the meantime, so what this is, it's, it's a high voltage inverter housing for an EV, and um, and for that to to work properly, of course, you've got to have electromagnetic shielding. So there's a challenge with uh, polymers and uh, and not providing any electromagnetic shielding. Um, so a uh, a a a coating was identified that was much much lighter than you know creating this part out of uh, out of solid aluminum. Um, and the, the PA6 mineral filled was the material that was identified that could function as a substrate that would hold up to both the, the, the coating process, um, but then also hold up to the, the part being in, in end use. And so uh, these parts were printed and then had a, a thin metallic coating applied uh, afterwards, much, much like a, uh, much like a, um, uh, a chroming process. But uh, uh, but with with the uh, you know the PA6 as the as the substrate, and so this was a, a waypoint in moving from this housing being made from aluminum and going into production in aluminum, uh, and going going into production in a in a PA6 um, injection molding material, and then being coated with uh, coated with the, uh, the the metallizing process. So. Um, it's a waypoint, a functional prototype to get us from, um, you know, something that's 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 a, a, an alloy and getting it into something that's that's a polymer. Um, in automotive, uh, weight reduction is king, and so uh, we're looking at a at a fifty percent weight reduction, uh, especially in EVs. The other functional prototype, this is the one we uh, this is the one I talked about earlier. This one is uh, is super interesting. So uh, once again. Um, company was looking to transition from um, from a uh, from a metal to a polymer to do engine mounts, and the the, the material that was selected was PA6. Now, this is not about printing engine mounts for production. This is about a a design validation uh, problem that came up where um, Daimler was needed. Um, I believe they needed 10 or 12 of these engine mounts to complete noise, vibration, and harshness testing. And they were the 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 injection molding tool was months away. 
And so BASF was commissioned to print parts that could be used for NVH testing. And uh, the challenge here was that the parts needed to be designed so that they would accurately uh, accurately represent how the injection molded parts would function once they were molded and, and assembled on the vehicle. And uh, so we were able to use the UltraSim software that we talked about, uh, talked about a little bit earlier. We were able to use the UltraSim software and create an accurate model that really functioned exactly like the, the molded one would, held up to the rigors of testing. And, uh, and uh, they were able to complete the NVH testing on schedule, kept the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the design and, uh, and production process in motion and then uh, once the injection molding tool was done we were able to drop in um, uh, the finished parts and uh, and keep the, the whole process moving along so it's a it's a really fascinating uh, fascinating story and uh, and really kept uh, kept Daimler on track for uh, for a new uh, a new vehicle launch here's another one that uh, that we've had um, we've had some some really good success with and and this one the the challenge is really twofold right so there, there's two things here that we're working on there's two things here that uh, two problems uh that can be solved sometimes they're sometimes they're in parallel and, and sometimes they're in series right um so the first problem is functional prototypes for like a design validation and that was what i uh, threw out earlier with the test mules um so you have a, a new design, and uh, and especially in in the EV market, and uh, in the self uh, self um, self driving cars, um, autonomous vehicles. That's what I that's uh, what I'm supposed to say <laughs> in this in the uh, autonomous vehicle market as well. Um, uh, washer bottles, fluid containers are becoming more and more uh, more and more important to uh, to keep cameras clean, and uh, and they're also becoming more and more complex. So being able to create custom structures, being able to test out those those structures, being able to slip them into new design vehicles, and uh, and being able to test that how how that all functions um, is uh, is really really important. Um, another another thing that's important about that is being able to weld. Uh, fittings into it, so so um, you have a so you have a standard fitting that's needed for uh, for like a degas bottle or even a washer bottle. Uh, you know you want to be able to use that standard fitting. Um, that might change depending on uh, uh, geography or or other things. And so the polypropylene, both the the MJF and the SLS polypropylene. Uh, weld very very well so you can weld on um you can weld on tabs you can weld on fittings um you can even print the bottle in half and weld together um so that's a that's a fantastic way that we've been able to solve the functional prototype problem the other problem that we see and this is uh, and this is probably one that's even more expensive and that is in the plant startup process um, so you when 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 a, a new a new model line is being started you have you know all of these different things that have to come into play and uh, and and a lot of them are blow molded polypropylene and so you can print and uh, print and use analogs as a stand in um, to either validate the manufacturing process or even to begin the manufacturing process, um, so you don't have you know a hundred thousand dollars an hour worth of uh, worth of machines and people standing around waiting for uh, waiting for uh, one injection molding tool um, to uh, to be finished so that the the, the blow molded parts can come in. Uh, again, the same idea where where we can do a lot of welding, we can do a lot of fastening to this material. It it, it accepts p uh, it accepts polypropylene to be welded. It accepts PA12. Um, basically any chemically compatible material will weld to it. Um, the welds we've also found are uh, are better than the uh, better strength than uh, the parent materials. So as we do burst testing and things like that, we're finding that failures come um, in the uh, in the parent material and not uh, and not in the weld joints. So it's uh, it's been a very very uh, robust material. We've been able to solve uh, solve a lot of problems um, in in those two areas especially. It's amazing that uh, 3D technology has gotten to the point where you don't have any porosity issues when creating stuff that holds liquid. Um, it's, it's, it's really amazing how far the technology has come. Yeah, the, uh, our polypropylene specifically is one of the few materials out there that, uh, that is both air and, uh, and watertight once, once printed. So um, there's no post-processing necessary for, um, for that material to be, uh, um, to be non-porous. So it will, it will hold wow. water, uh, will hold air, and it, uh, and it will hold pressure. 
It's amazing. This is one of uh, this is one of my favorites that uh, um, that keeps keeps growing and keeps building. Uh, we've got a project uh, going right now with an OEM that's super super exciting uh, around this. So the whole world of the whole world of lattice structures in 3D printing is uh, um, I, at the at the AMUG conference. I did a I did an entire hour, hour long presentation on it. I didn't even scratch the surface. Um, but what you can do with lattice structures um, and 3D printing, the combination, right, is uh, is quite amazing. Um, you can you can tune responses for um, uh, for energy return for energy absorption. Uh, obviously, you can you can customize hard, soft, depending on. Um, different points. Uh, so, like if you see this headrest, you can have a you can have a spot in the center that's very very soft, but then uh, area around the outside where you need some energy absorption, which is harder. But in the event of a you know in the event of an impact, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a, an absorber, um, and it's going to to help control loads. So, um, what you can do in with the uh, with the lattice structure is um, is really quite amazing um, for for comfort for safety um, and in this case we uh, we actually worked on uh, we worked on a headrest and uh, and seat components where um, the lattice structure was made uh, for for comfort right so so different grades of uh, of vehicles have different comfort requirements your your less expensive vehicles uh, typically you're you're going to have a harder headrest harder seats um, built for durability. As you move up in that process, you're going to have softer, uh, softer seats. Uh, everything is just going to be a little bit more comfortable. Um, so you can do that with the same material, just different build strategies. Um, and then you can also create an open structure, an open internal structure that allows um, heating and cooling to uh, to move through the entire seat. So um, I like my I like my heated and cooled seats the the way they are now. But uh, but um, with the ability to to move air and and distribute it throughout the entire surface. Um, is uh, uh, is just uh, just kind of that that next step in uh, uh, in comfort and technology. So um, here again, we use the UltraSim software to um, to create the responses that we needed, to create the airflow that we needed, and um, and then we chose uh, we we and the customer um, chose the uh, uh, you can see that, that this is a this is an MJF process um, because the TPU01 material for the MJF process is so repeatable and uh, and has um, has such uh, such good performance over yeah hundreds and hundreds of build cycles so we wanted to develop something that was pointed in the right direction for uh, for a uh, for an application uh, where we where we would could actually be on car. Uh, in, a, in a program. To, to be able to do that, and then if you want to flip to the next slide, Rhonda, um, we also went after the, um, we went after some some uh, certifications to be able to go into um, into the vehicle interiors. So so our TPU material has um, has uh, passed here. What you can uh, what you can see um, on uh, on these tests uh, specifically for uh, for vehicle interiors. Um, you can see on the uh, on the VOC and and the uh, and the FOG we had uh, we had a pass with uh, with a coating, and um, and so uh, uh, all of this detailed information. If uh, if you have a if you have an application, uh, if you have an idea and uh, and you're and you're serious about it, that sounds like the sounds like the A team, right? If 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 you need help and you can find them, maybe you can hire. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this is this is stuff that's that's uh, you know uh, understandably NDA protected. Uh, but if you have an application, uh, my contact information will be at the uh, at the end here. Uh, by all means, reach out and uh, and let's chat. Uh, we can make this uh, all this uh, and and more detail available. But uh, but we do have the we do have those interior tests uh, passed and uh, and we're 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 in in a good place to be able to to take advantage of uh, of applications like this with with interiors. Now, when this is like this data is like particulates in the air, right? Is that what this is specifically talking about? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So these are these are standard standards of um, standards of, uh, of of VOC consent condensable substances. Uh, as you can see, they're formaldehyde and and uh, and just general odor. Um, so, which means you don't get the new car smell because the new car smell basically is formaldehyde. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, never knew that. Yes, you've you've yeah. ruined the new car smell, yeah. Jeremy. Yeah, uh, I know. 
There's a, there a question about TPU. Have you ever coated it with metal? No, no. I to to my knowledge, to my knowledge, no. Um. So I think that uh, I think that. Um, you know, we, we, you could, you, you would definitely lose some, you would definitely lose the, the elastomeric, uh, properties, right. With, uh, with a, uh, with a metallized coating. Um, but, uh, there's a potential, I think maybe for a, you know, for, for, a, a some type of masking operation, right. Where, where you could, uh, where you could build into, especially even, you know, build into the, the structure of the part, um, a, uh, a, a masking apparatus that, uh, that could allow you if you wanted to have a portion, right? So, so let's say you're you're working on a, a flexible interior badge, or maybe a threshold, or something like that, and you wanted to have a piece of that metal coated. Uh, obviously, you'll you'll lose your uh, you'll lose your elastomeric properties. Um, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't uh, why it wouldn't wouldn't work. I'm also not a chemist. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So this is one. This is one of those applications that we're talking about that just isn't that terribly, uh, terribly exciting. It's uh, you, this this kind of stuff doesn't get presented in the board meetings as a as a rah rah uh, <laughs> application. But this is one of those ways that 3D printing is being used every day. And um, so so this is a um, this is a, a a patented product from from a company called Xtol. They do a lot of um, um, custom machines for plastic assembly. And they needed to solve a problem where they needed a work holding device that was inexpensive, um, easy to change out, and super easy to customize. And so for that, they chose the uh, the TPU. So uh, you can see that uh, just the very, very end of that work holding device is uh, is a little bit different color. And uh, and that is the TPU. Uh, the TPU, it has been tested to uh, to not mar, not scratch. It'll, uh, it'll protect class A surfaces. Uh, there's a video floating around out there from my buddy, Paul DeWise, uh, who um, put a uh, put a uh, did a test of uh, I think a hundred thousand cycles of pressing um, pressing a, a class a badge into a TPU holder um, and uh, did it a hundred thousand times and and kept shimming it uh, to uh, to make it to make it to uh, um, uh, rub on and, and, and try to dam it rub on the edge of the of the TPU and try to damage it uh, no damage to the uh, no damage to the badge whatsoever other than he shimmed it far enough that uh, that a piece of the badge broke off uh, but no scratching, uh, no scratching whatsoever. So, um, so this material is able to hold Class A finishes. It's able to hold them in place, and uh, and as you can see, there's a t it's a tiny little picture, so it's hard. It's kind of hard to see, but but it's just the very tip of that work holding device. So if if the geometry changes in your finished piece, you don't have to start over. You can just change those uh, um, those work holding end factors, and uh, and you can. Um, and you can do a, uh, you know, make a make a a, a a process change very very quickly. Um, big uh, big benefits here, of course. Uh, costing is uh, is is within five percent of traditional manufacturing, which is a big deal. Um, knowing that you don't need to create a mold, uh, you know, you can you can go to uh, you can go to direct print. Um, and like I said, part changes only require that TPU. So um, so. And so it's it, and it's also user serviceable, right? Uh, so so if you've got um, you've got a part change, or even if you've got a part that wears out, um, you don't have to have a technician come in, take the entire tool out of service to replace those uh, those end factors. Um, they have a they have a little internal locking system in them. The operator, the person running the machine, can see that um, see that there's a damaged piece there. Uh, grab a hold of it, pull it off, slide the new one on. And they're back. Uh, they're back running. So literally, uh, literally zero downtime. Um, so it's been a it's been a neat one. Uh, neat one to explore. This one is the the spare parts application, right? That we were that we were talking about earlier. So this is uh, this is one that's been proven out. Um, this is uh, this is a project we worked with uh, folks at General Motors. Um, uh, so, so this is a part that they're required to to be able to produce. Um, it is a uh, it's a recall part for early '90s um, full size Chevy Silverados, uh, and they're not all. I I owned a 1994 Chevy Silverado. I probably needed this. I it's long it's long gone. Um, but um, 
they're required to have this part in hand. And so if they were a, if they were need, if they needed to produce this part traditionally, um, you know, we were looking at a twenty thousand dollar tool cost, and then um, the cost of of carrying inventory, or alternatively, the cost of uh, you know paying uh, an injection molding house to uh, to do short run. Um, so literally, with this application, the minimum order quantity is one. That is all they need. Um, and so it, it's this idea of allowing GM to uh, to carry a digital stock of parts, print on demand, and uh, eliminate the tooling, eliminate the eliminate the warehouse space uh, requirements. Now, you know, as we as we kind of take this and we look into the future, so we look into the far, um, we can see um, companies like uh, like Shapeways getting involved in this and being able to do this production on demand, being able to do this production. Um, close to close to where the parts are are needed, um, and that's kind of one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways that that this stuff fits together for us, right? Is uh, is things like this where um, where we start to prove out applications like this, and then we have partners um, that are uh, that are qualified and and uh, and able to print and um, and help with with that that idea of the uh, uh, of that uh, that digital inventory. So this is a really exciting one. It's it's a it's a, it's a ways down the line for um, you know for for large scale, but it's a perfect proof of concept, and um, and it was a, it was a fun one to work on. All right. A few more minutes to add any questions. Steve, I don't know if you have any questions on your end while we're waiting for our audience. So I guess mine's not really a question. It's more of just kind of like a frame of reference. Like when we're talking about spare parts, right? I think a lot of times when 3D printing out of manufacturing really has ramped up and, and people wanted to do it, they thought, you know, hey, you'll be able just to go to of the 3D printer and print out the metal functional part. That's spare parts that we'll see it. Um, and it's, it's, it's taking a little bit longer than, than you see. However, one thing I have started to see is um, like older cars, you know, like car, cars that they're trying to, to refurbish or bring, bring back or anything else. Um, I'm seeing a lot of actual traction there because these are unique parts you can't get anymore, right. you know. So um, maybe people aren't using something that's, uh, to the um, certification level that a lot of, uh, of the, the top flight car companies that are using to kind of deploy and everything else. However, I am seeing, and you can even see it on like shows like Jay Leno's Garage, where they're actually creating spare parts that are actually functional parts that are going in cars, but maybe don't meet the regulation levels that we're wanting to. So I think kind of, Jeremy, when you're talking about like, you know, this is the future, we're just not there yet. I think a lot of it, not only from a technology standpoint, but all a lot of it's also just certification standpoint. And I think going back to one of the comments you made earlier saying, you know, hey, we worked four and a half years to certify this flexible material. Um, I think that's going to be kind of the same of what you're seeing specifically in the automotive industry is stuff that people are certifying right now and are working on right now um, that we don't know about is really, I think, what's going to be the future of it, the spare part market and even more so on that huge picture of all the different parts in the car. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just really excited to kind of see where it goes and and probably a little bit um, need to to hold my excitement back because we got to just go and kind of go through the process, right? We got to make sure uh, that we test and validate all these parts before uh, they're used it, into it. So, yeah, that's a really, that's a really good point. Um, and, and, and there's, you know, they're, they're just, just, so, so we're, we're starting to see, we're starting to see that kind of, those those two curves collide, right? We're, we're, or at least, or at least, we're starting to see where where they're going to be able to collide. We're 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 getting more and more applications for spare parts, and we're getting better and better quality in the the material that's available, right? And so we're starting to see these projects that are that are that are in the in the the um you know the the not near and the far, uh, but they're uh but 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 you can start to see that as they come together they're going to make massive massive changes in how um uh, how vehicle service is done in how uh, manufacturing is done um you know adding adding a printer with the right material to the side of a manufacturing line can can literally eliminate hundreds of millions of dollars of cost in warehousing in um 
uh, in, in, in shipping uh, just because things can be produced on site and they can be produced flexibly, right? So, so, so a line changes for a day. We printed those parts yesterday and they're ready to go. And, and that's that's far, right? That's that's the, the, don't don't hear me say it's near, but but we're starting to see the where the materials and the demand are gonna are going to 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 meet off there in the distance, and uh, and I think the more people are excited about it, like you, Steve, um, and the people on this call that have influence in in the industry on a on a granular level, uh, it's going to come faster than we think. We do have a couple of questions. Cool. Uh, could you talk about places where UV curable materials are being used? And are there any end use applications for UV cured materials? Um, so there are a couple that are outside of, that I know of that are outside of the BASF portfolio. Um, so our UV curables are probably, um, we're, if, if, I, if I'm honest, we're a little behind, uh, we're a little bit behind the curve. Um, our, uh, like I said earlier, our, th that's the fastest growing segment. Um, and, uh, and we're, that's the, the one that's getting the, the most development attention really, um, uh, as far as, uh, as far as ours go. Um, we're working on a couple of, uh, we're working on a couple of production, uh, applications with, uh, with OEMs, but right now, as far as our, our UV curables go, I, uh, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a good, uh, a good solid production case. Um, you know, we're, we're working actively in the, in the prototyping and the functional prototyping. Um, but that, uh, that production case is, uh, is a little bit out yet. Are there any BASF materials that have a reuse recycle potential? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so, and, and, and we keep, we keep working on this, uh, uh um, you know, it's one of those things where we have to we have to add staff, we have to add resources um, as we as we keep expanding what we're trying to do, right? So 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 step number one is getting those those materials functional and getting them in the marketplace. Um, of course, the 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 PA11, the base material for PA11, is, uh, is is an organic material, and so those materials all have different varying levels of um, varying levels of, uh, of recyclability, reusability. Uh, all of our materials um, on the powder bed fusion side have a very, very good refresh rate. So if you're familiar with the process, right, it, you, you use some virgin material and some used material in, uh, in any, uh, any, pro any, any powder bed process um, where you're, you're recoding, whenever you recode, you're, you're using some, uh, some new and some old material. Uh, so we have some of the highest refresh rates in the industry. Most of our materials will run at least 70% used to 30% new. Um, so that keeps our, that keeps what's going to waste in a build um, uh, very, very reasonable. As far as the end use parts and finding ways to do to do a second life, um, we've done a we've done a, a series of studies around our TPU. Um, the TPU uh, and, and this is kind of a theme uh, uh, that we're talking about here today uh, because we've put a lot of effort and we've put a lot of time into the TPU because we think that that thermoplastic urethane is going to have um, a lot of different potential applications: uh, automotive, consumer, uh, medical. Uh, there's just a lot there, so we've uh, we've put some resources into finding a second life path for the TPU, and what we've discovered is that um, BASF has a uh, you know has a, has a injection molding grades of TPU of course, and uh, and so our printable TPU, uh, those finished parts can be uh, can be added to regrind that's fed back into uh, the injection molding process with our regular TPU and um, anywhere from, we tested anywhere from 30 up to 100% regrind in and found uh, and found no degradation in material performance um, for, uh, for those tests. So, so what that means is, uh, let's say uh, you're uh, an OEM and you are printing um, you know, hundreds of thousands of those little, those little end factors, right. For, uh, for, for work holding, um, for assembly tools, you've got, you've got these little things and, and every day you've got your, uh, you've got your factory folks that are that, that one or two of those wears out, they go into a bin and you're collecting a, a fair number of, uh, of these pieces. Well, rather than going to landfill, those can go to a production facility uh, maybe that's one of your tiers. Maybe that's an internal uh, internal production facility, and uh, that they are um, when when they're producing 
uh, an injection molded TPU part, uh, they've got flashing and uh, and other waste that they're that's getting trimmed off of that injection molded part and thrown into regrind. Well, these uh, TPU parts that were used in your tooling process can also be chucked into the regrind and uh, and utilized and, and come out in uh, come out in um, in elastomeric injection molded parts that can be used uh, once again in in the uh, in the uh, assembly process. So that's the one that we have right now that's closest. Um, there's a there's a division internally that's uh, of course um, all working on and, and angled towards uh, increasing and uh, and understanding our uh, our sustainability in the marketplace. Both so much for doing this wonderful webinar and presentation today. Uh, and thank you everyone who has joined throughout and asked questions. If you have any additional questions, please visit shapeways.com and you can see the BASF partner page to learn more about what we discussed today. So have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks everybody.